The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Innocent until proven guilty. It's a fundamental right in our legal system, but when public opinion weighs in, the going can be tough. Tonight, we'll hear from one of Canada's top criminal defense lawyers, Marie Hennon, on why she's made it her life's work. Then, our Ontario Hubs explain concerns of our post-secondary program for students with severe disabilities that was canceled during the pandemic. And from Olympian Penny Alexiak to why Hamilton is debating density versus sprawl, we've got the Agendas Week in Review. It's Friday, October 15th, and that's next on The Agenda. She's been called serious, ruthless, brilliant, formidable. Marie Hennon is one of Canada's top criminal defense lawyers, representing clients you've heard of accused of terrible crimes. And if you've ever wondered how can she do that, well, she explains it and a great deal more in her riveting new memoir. It's called Nothing But the Truth. Marie Hennon is senior partner at Hennon Hutchinson LLP, and she joins us now from her office in Ontario's capital city. Hi, it's very nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Hi, Nam. Um, so you, in your book, you write that uh, when people ask you why you chose to become a criminal defense lawyer, that they're not really interested in hearing your answer because they've already made up their mind about why. Um, and in the book, uh, you say that they call what you do unseemly. And you write that what you do wasn't an, an, ac wasn't an accident. It was intentional. So why, and I really want to know this answer, <laughs> uh, why did you choose criminal law? And why do you think people respond in that way? Well, I've always loved uh, criminal law. I loved it for a number of reasons. One of the reasons was it was suitable to my personality. I love the daily work. I love the fact that it changes up with every single case. Uh, I love um, the advocacy part of it. A courtroom is a home to me and one of the places I enjoy being the most. Uh, in terms of the content of it, I was always attracted to the justice issues. I was always attracted to uh, the fact that dealing with laws really govern how we behave, uh, moral values, social values. Uh, I like uh, being an outsider. I like fighting for the underdog. Uh, I like challenging the state uh, and the status quo. So all of those things really combined made it the, the perfect uh, job for me. And 30 years later, I still think that you know, in terms of the public's reaction, I get it. I think they don't uh, get a lot of information about what our role is in the architecture of the legal system. And so it's easy to confuse you with your client. It's easy to not understand exactly what it is you're supposed to be doing in a courtroom, uh, which is making the state prove its case, which is challenging uh, the status quo, challenging laws that we think are unconstitutional. That is really our role. And I think it sometimes gets lost. Well, you describe, it's interesting because in the book, too, you describe yourself as an outsider, that you are fighting for the underdog. But um, you also write in the book that you're tired of being called polarizing and controversial, and that it's your choice of profession, as you say, that is, um, you write that your mother's lullaby for you, which is so lovely, uh, was that you are no different from a man. Um, how much of what you do is about ambition versus what your mother taught you? It's uh, mostly about what my mother taught me and my love of the profession. You can be as ambitious as you want. It doesn't necessarily uh, get you anywhere and doesn't get you results. Uh, what drove me and continues to drive me is uh, an absolute love of and commitment uh, to what I do. Uh, there really is nothing else that allows you to keep going through it and, and to put in the types of hours and uh, work. But, you know, in terms of your comment, comment about me being uh, polarizing, I always find that odd because nobody knows what my personal views are, although they might know a little bit more as a result of this book, uh, but they don't know what my political views are and my personal leanings are. And so when someone calls you polarizing, not knowing you, you have to think, what is it about you that they're identifying as polarizing? And the only thing they know about me is my job, what work I do. Uh, so that's what's really polarizing. It's not me. I'm not an inherently controversial person. My job is what's 
inciting controversy. And that's really unfortunate. And I just wanted to say that it wasn't me saying that you were polarizing. You actually say <laughs> that you write that in the book that this is what people okay. say. Um, okay. We're living, it's 2021, and we're still seeing the first of a gender or the first uh, of an ethnicity. Um, why are women judged so harshly for their strength and ambition? Well, I think that women are judged harshly, period, uh, for their strength, for their ambition, for not having enough ambition, for not being strong enough, for being too tall, too short, being too loud, too quiet. I mean, our, our bodies are constantly up for grabs. Think of the elections that are being fought. Think of what's happening in, in Texas, where the public conversation is about us and our bodies. In the Middle East, it is an ongoing discussion, the scope of what we can do. So, you know, when you talk about the judgment that women are subjected to, it's from all quarters. It's uh, from all areas. And so it becomes very difficult, I think, for us to get our bearings and to get a bit of the breathing space to to make our own decisions and to see ourselves in the way that, that we think works for us. Um, from childhood, you were told by adults, uh, both men and women, you were told to be softer, to be more diplomatic. Uh, you've been described as hard, and you say that you're actually okay with people describing you as being hard. Um, you also write that empathy is not your go-to move. Um, are there parts of you that you feel are misunderstood? Well, I think you'd have to know me to, to understand me. Um, I don't think there are parts of me that are misunderstood. I think uh, what is uh, misunderstood is the whole of me. Uh, I think people see certain parts and not others. Uh, so, you know, what you see in the courtroom when you see that I'm tough or, uh, you know, aggressive or whatever it is you think I am, I don't think that a different person comes home. So, look, there are good things about my personality. There are things that I think are not so good. Uh, certainly empathy is not my go-to move, but I'm fortunate to be surrounded by people who always check that. So, you know, I think in this book, what I was trying to show is uh, a little bit fuller uh, a picture. Um, I think a lot of people, when they heard that you were writing a book, assumed that you would be writing a book about some of the cases that you've been a part of. Uh, why didn't you include those cases in your book? You know, I think to get a real understanding of cases uh, beyond what you've read already in the newspaper or what some clients of mine have chosen to write about, I'd have to be able to tell you about conversations that I've had with them. I'd have to be able to tell you about moments that we've had. Uh, I've had to, I'd have to tell you so many different things that I cannot tell you because the law protects um, a solicitor client relationship and all those intimate or more detailed things, the things that you haven't read about that would give you a fuller picture are just um, not things I can talk about as a matter of ethics. And so what would I be telling you? I'd be telling you things you've already seen. I'd be telling you uh, things you've already read about. And also, you know, I don't think my clients or the witnesses who've testified really need to now live through my assessment or my personal opinion of them. Uh, it's a difficult process for everybody who goes through it and they're entitled to dignity and they're entitled to move on from it, and they're also entitled to talk about it if they choose to, uh, but I, I'm not gonna be the one to do that. So look, I know my own story and that's the one I think I can tell. Um, I wanted to read a, an, expert, an excerpt from your book um, and you write, here are the questions I get asked most often as a criminal defense lawyer. How can you defend someone you know is guilty? How can you defend someone charged with a heinous crime? How can you as a woman defend a man charged with sexual assault? How can you as a parent defend someone charged with abusing a child? The list of moral dilemmas that the public assumes present me with a personal struggle as a defense lawyer is endless. What personal struggle is that? Well, I, I think people assume that I am morally uh, struggling because I defend people charged with crimes. And uh, to ask those questions means that you don't really understand what it is that my role is as a criminal lawyer. And it is not to make moral judgments. So look, is it difficult sometimes to deal with the type of things that we deal with? For sure, we are human. But the role and the profession requires me to check my personal views, check my personal opinions, and do my job for my client and maintain my role in the administration of justice, which is a very specific one. So there's no time for those sorts of considerations. And knowing my role in the system, I don't feel morally compromised at all. I think it's an honorable profession.
Um, I just want to push back a little bit, and I'm trying to um, ask this question in a respectful manner, because um, I think there's some people within society who, uh, when they think of the justice system, they have an inherent understanding that justice is not for them. And you also write about that in your book. There's certain groups, um, you know, black, indigenous, people of color, that uh, are, are overrepresented in our justice system. And it's not, you know, some bigots might think that it's because maybe those groups are inherently criminal, which is not the case. Um, so even with judges, uh, everybody has their own bias. So how do you square that? Well, that's a, it's a really great question. I mean, on one hand, we think that our justice system is good because it is humane. You know, we don't have strict sentencing guidelines, for example, as the United States does and contributed significantly to the over-incarceration of, of racialized groups in the states. So we have humanity that you can look at all of it, you can use your judgment, you can apply discretion. But at the same time, if you're going to give that to the court, if you're going to let them use their judgment, you have to know that it's a human process. And so people are going to judge from a perspective of what they know and what they understand. You know, that's why you see calls for a more diversified bench, a more diversified justice system, more diversity in policing, because you bring your personal experiences and hopefully that informs some of your assessments or inferences or reactions. Um, you know, the case that has probably affected public perceptions of you um, is your su successful defense of Gian uh, Gomeshi, the former CBC broadcaster, who was charged with multiple counts of sexual assault. Um, did you have any reservations about taking on that case? No, I've represented other people charged with that crime. I'm not the first person in history to defend a person charged with sexual assault. I'm not the first female to do so. Men have been doing it for centuries, and no one's been confused by that. Uh, it shouldn't cause any confusion or um, concern. It is like any other case I have acted on. And some of your critics have called you a traitor to your gender. How do you respond to that accusation? Well, I don't respond to that accusation because I'm not you know, I think we women have a lot of things in the community that we need to deal with. I don't think we need to be fighting with each other. So, uh, you know, it, it's of no moment to me. It's uh, it, it's not a, a conversation that I think really advances uh, our interests collectively and certainly uh, wouldn't advance mine. Um, you know, I just want to push back on that because the people who, like advocates for uh, survivors of uh, sexual assault, uh, one of the things that was brought up um, within the court system itself, um, one of the criticism was that you brought up the accuser's uh, past sexual experiences in the courtroom, um, and therefore it was as if they were on trial as well. What do you make of that accusation? Well, that's not accurate, first of all. Um, the law is very strict about when you can introduce a prior sexual history, including prior sexual history, even with the accused. Uh, you have to bring an application. Uh, you have to give notice. There's full argument. So that, that wasn't at play, first of all, in that trial. Uh, but there are, and the Supreme Court of Canada has done a great deal to move uh, our thinking and the court's thinking around that and to really constrain uh, that type of evidence. So it's not an easy threshold. It's not an accurate uh, assessment of what happens in court. And so, you know, just on that point, what is important is for people to come to court and actually see what happens, to read the law, to understand when this type of evidence comes in and when it doesn't, what the most recent cases are. It's, it's very, uh, very constrained. Um, is there a way, you know, we, we did hear from some of the women who were part of that specific trial who, say, who said that they felt like they were being uh, put on trial. Is there a way to protect a victim from further trauma in the courtroom while also protecting the rights of the accused? Yes, and we've done a really good job, I think, of doing that, and there's a lot more to be done. Uh, you know, victims can get representation now, which is important because you need to understand what the process is. Uh, you have representation in a lot of the applications. We've acknowledged and recognized and protected privacy interests of uh, complainants. So there are a lot of things that have happened in the law for many years, you know, quite substantially over the last two decades, and a lot more we can do 
uh, to make it uh, a better process. But the one thing we shouldn't be doing is the public shouldn't be scared to come to a court. They shouldn't assume that the decks are stacked against them. They shouldn't assume that they're being put on trial. That is incorrect. You are not being put on trial. And I say this having represented many, many complainants, victims of sexual assault. You know, what you need to understand is how the process works. And uh, that obviously uh, versions of events are going to be questioned. Uh, you, you, but you have to understand why that's happening. You have to understand that it is not a personal attack, but it is profoundly difficult. There's no question that everybody sitting in that courtroom has a difficult time of the process. Uh, it is emotional. It is, um, it, you know, it, it's a deeply personal experience. So what we want in the system is not that it's a pleasant experience. We want to make sure that everyone is heard. Oh, and so that and the end, just if I can finish that up, just that the, the environment is correct to allow people to uh, tell the version of events that they want to, to tell their story um, fully. Um, you also write about people being judge, jury, and executioner on social media. Um, and I think also the trial that you had with Gomeshi was on the news every single night. Um, so maybe the media needs to do a better job of conveying what you just said about what the situation really is like inside those courtrooms. Um, why does it bother you if all that matters is what happens in the courtroom? Well, what bothers me is that I've spent my life, my profession in the administration of justice. And I think we have uh, a very uh, good justice system, one that we should be proud of. That does not mean we can't criticize it. We should criticize it because there are always ways to make it better, to make it fair. We have indigenous uh, members of the community, racialized members of the community, overcharged, over-incarcerated, over-tried. Those are things we need to correct. So it bothers me when we get um, criticism that is not informed, because then we're not having the right conversations. We're not implementing the right changes. And I think there is a responsibility um, on us that are in the system, uh, those of us who report on it, to provide the public with information so that they can make the decisions that they want to make and that they can engage politicians in conversations that they want to have. But you can't do that uh, based on a 140 character tweet. You just simply cannot. And so social media is one place to get information, but it's not the only place to get information. And I think a lot of your, um, how people perceive you has been shaped on social media. Um, and after the Gomeshi case, you have been invited to speak at many different events. And in your book, you write about um, something that happened after you were invited to one of these events. You write in the book, the very thought of me and my choice of profession seemingly causes a stir in the now rarefied academic enclaves where challenging thought has been replaced by a sensitive gentleness more appropriate to a Victorian parlor and where the mere thought of an unpleasant comment can bring on nervous shock. Um, were you, you know, when you were invited to speak at a university, um, counselors were made available in the lecture hall uh, and prefaced your public lecture with a trigger warning. Uh, were you surprised by that reaction? Well, I was profoundly surprised by it because they hadn't asked me what I was talking about. Uh, and what I was talking about was not anything that would have triggered anybody. It was about the history of our justice system, of how it works. Uh, it was not incendiary. It was not designed to be triggering. It was not a discussion of sexual assault at all. Um, but the trigger warning was given without speaking to me and asking me, look, what are you going to talk about uh, in your speech? And the presumption that students won't engage with you, and they did, by the way, it was a, a great conversation, and won't ask you questions or would be alarmed if you had different views, um, is, is wrong-headed. Uh, I don't think we're that sensitive. I don't think we're that uh, weak, that we can't handle uh, different thoughts or challenging thoughts. That doesn't mean it has to be a yelling match, and it doesn't mean you have to be incendiary or volatile or obnoxious or a shock jock to have a meaningful conversation. We can have meaningful conversations where we don't agree or we learn things or we hear things that we, we just think differently about uh, without being shocked and, and warned uh, about the conversation. I just, I think the way that we're setting up uh, conversations and academic discussions and debates is really, really 
um, unfortunate. Um, you write in the book um, that you really wanted to work with Eddie Greenspan, and he was your boss for many years. And um, I'm assuming that some of the cases that he took, he, you know, he probably took cases are, are similar to yours, where people might not have supported uh, the person that he was uh, defending. Um, do you do you wonder why maybe other male attorneys don't have the same reaction uh, that you caused for people to have? Well, there's no question that women in a, a, a public eye um, are judged on a bit of a different standard. You know, I, I think of Hillary Clinton and the judgment of her. Uh, the judgment was what? that Not that she was not qualified, not that she wasn't a smart lady, uh, but that her pantsuit color was awful or that there was something about her that wasn't quite right, you know, that she was nasty, uh, a nasty woman. And so... You know, women are judged on a bit of a different standard, and what's brought to it, uh, brought to bear on that judgment, I think, are assumptions about about us, about what we should do, how we should behave, uh, what it means when we look a particular way, dress a particular way, adopt a particular profession. So, no, it, it is uh, certainly perplexing that the fact that as a female, I'm doing the same job that men have done for centuries. Uh, would cause anybody to be shocked or alarmed by it. I know you said earlier that you didn't have any reservations on taking on the Gomeshi case, um, but it feels you're probably f tired of talking um, about that case. <laughs> and um, do you, and it's probably going to maybe define your career. I don't know uh, if I'm speaking out of turn. But I'm, I'm wondering if you've had those thoughts and whether or not maybe you regret taking the case on? I don't regret taking any case uh, that I've done on because I don't regret how I've um, performed my professional obligation. I don't regret my role in the, in the justice system. So I don't regret uh, cases that I've taken on. Um, and it, it would be like asking a doctor if they regretted doing their job. I, I don't regret doing my job. There isn't a single day I go to bed regretting doing the work that I do. Um, you wrote at the beginning, you wrote that um, you wanted, when you were writing this book, you spoke to your family members because you were trying to understand who you are um, through them. What did you learn about yourself? You know, it's interesting. I think I learned that, that uh, the immigrant um, experience, uh, being an immigrant, uh, and, and all of it that comes along with getting your footing in a new country and your family sort of settling in and understanding it is an experience that at, at my ripe old age uh, still uh, really is visceral for me and is really very much a part of the way I look at my place in a lot of areas, including in this profession. Uh, that I think I learned that um, I hadn't necessarily worked all of that through. And you said it was important for people to know your name, and that's why you didn't change it for your dad. Yes, that's very true. Why was that important? Well, you know, he came to this country, we came to this country, and he wanted us to have a shot. Uh, my family wanted me to have a, a shot as a woman in particular. And I always said to them that, uh, you know, if I, if, the, if I fail, it'll be... Uh, their name, it'll, and if I succeed, it certainly uh, should be their name that's recognized. Um, it's who I am. It's my name. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm not changing myself or my name for anybody. Um, when future lawyers ask you for advice in the book, you offer this to them. You write, be prepared to give up a significant part of yourself. What did you mean by that? Uh, the job is difficult, uh, and the job weighs on you in a lot of different ways. Uh, you're required to uh, be relatively resilient and impervious to a lot of stuff. Uh, you work through things that are uh, difficult, and most people don't don't have to deal with. And so, what it does is it means that it's very hard for you to then come home and play Lego, right? Or come home and just be cheerful when you've spent an entire day. In a murder trial, it's it's hard to switch gears. And what happens ultimately, I think, uh, at least for me, is that the it, it, the gears can't be switched at some point. You know, it becomes more of your personality. And so it, it's it's uh, more than just a, a job. It, it's very much a profession that that defines who you are. And there are great things about it, 
but there are negative things about it, you know, and, and you do have to be tough and it's not, you know, it's great to be tough in court. It may not be so great when you're having dinner with your family. And I love that you mentioned, uh, you talked about the idea that women are asked, how do you balance it? But uh, we rarely ask men that question. Um, congratulations on the book. Your family sounds incredible. Um, thank you so much, Marie. We appreciate all the time you gave us tonight. Thanks, Nam. A lot has changed for everyone during this pandemic, but for some students who had finally found a rare offering that allowed for independent living and learning, the loss of a post-secondary program is potentially devastating. With us to explain, Sarah Trick. She's an Ontario Hub's editor, and she joins us now from Ottawa. Hey, hello, Sarah. Hi, Jan. So I want to talk about the Attendant Service Program. As we mentioned, it is quite a rare program in this country and in this province. Uh, what do we need to know about it and who actually offers this program? So the Attendant Services Program is run through Carleton University in Ottawa with a satellite site at Algonquin College. Um, what it does is it offers 24-hour attendant care to students living in residence who have disabilities and who need help with personal care. So they do stuff like helping people go to the bathroom, helping people get dressed and go to bed, um, get up, anything that they might need um, in residence to live an independent life. Now, is this program uh, hiring personal support care workers or are these students who are also helping out in this program? Um, it is mostly students, but then sometimes they hire um, PSWs as well. But primarily it's, also, it's students. Now, this program has been cancelled uh, this semester and you had the opportunity to chat with some students who would have normally taken part in this class. Uh, can you give us an idea of why this program was cancelled? Of course, we're in the midst of a pandemic. Uh, what did that have to play in that? So the, um, the program was originally shut down in the middle of March when everybody went home from universities. Um, it continued to be shut down throughout the following I guess until, sorry, like between March and then up to now. Um, what's different now is that um, Carleton University has returned to mostly in-person instruction for this fall. It has opened its residence. Um, it is having in-person events, um, but it has not brought back the attendance services program. Uh, you had mentioned, you know, all of that stuff, including, you know, uh, recreational sports and team sports. All of those have been given green light. Uh, a lot of these universities have vaccine requirements. Uh, shouldn't that all help in terms of getting this program back up and running? It should. Um, Carlton itself does have a vac vaccination requirement, um, even to live in residence or to attend classes. Um, it has screening measures um, and other health measures in place. Um, but the university has said that they do not want to bring it back at this time because the nature of providing personal care doesn't allow for physical distancing. Now, you have some personal experience with the attendant service program. I'm hoping you can share some of your insights at sort of what's at stake for students who aren't able to uh, sort of take part and be in person on campus uh, while enrolling in, in classes? Okay, so there's a lot at stake here. Um, first of all, I'll say um, I lived at Carleton on and off, um, I think for about nine or 10 years. I was a client of the attendant services program. And what it did was it allowed me to live an independent life. So I moved there when I was almost 19. I had never bought my own groceries. Um, I had never been able to use the bus regularly. I had never been able to manage my own schedule. My parents did that for me, not because of any lack of capacity, but because like the infrastructure wasn't there. So when I moved to Carleton, the infrastructure was there and I was able to live um, an independent life, um, participate in classes and in the social life of campus. Um, now that is not available to these students. And um, the university has said that they are planning to give people, um, clients online options so that they can continue with their studies. But a lot of people um, don't have options to attend those classes. For example, I spoke to a journalism student. She's not able to take her um, 
radio and TV required courses this year. So if the program doesn't come back, she'll have to delay her graduation because there's just too much in-person instruction in order for her to feasibly do it on Zoom. There was also uh, a couple of students that you spoke to, one in particular that kind of uh, highlighted sort of the, the added pressure on families and students. There was one student who uh, decided to sort of forego his semester or their semester. Do you mind telling me about that story? Yes, so one student um, basically has told me he was at Algonquin College and um, he had to move back in with his parents. And he told me that he was not able to continue with his studies because there, there just wasn't the support there for him. And it would require too much work from his family as his primary caregivers to be able to make that feasible. Another um, student that I spoke to said that she was only offered two hours a week of care from an agency. Um, she needs multiple visits of care per day. So um, the university says that they're trying to diminish the risks, but one of the points that one of these students made is that um, they're still at risk. They have less care than they would at Carleton. There's no accessible housing options for them. Basically, they are falling through the, falling through the cracks. You had touched on sort of the the experiences that you went through uh, being at Carleton, being a part of the program for nine years. Can you talk to me a little bit about sort of the long term outcomes? Um, you know, you had mentioned that this, you, you know, you never bought groceries before. You never had that sort of independent living. Can you tell me a little bit about sort of beyond those university years, what this program sort of uh, sort of means for these students? Um, to put it bluntly, I have a job. Mm -hmm. And I'm able to live in an apartment by myself with caregivers, um, which I wouldn't have been able to learn the skills to manage caregivers if I hadn't been part of the attendant services program. When um, people live at home with their families, even if the families try to foster independence in the children, it, often the, just the resources aren't there. Um, it's harder to attain things like a degree um, just the educational and employment outcomes aren't there. And then it, there is data showing that the more severe one's disability is and the more care you need, the less likely you are to get a higher education or um, full-time employment. Um, you spoke to some experts, I'm hoping, um, and you've been through this program. Are there any suggestions you have um, for students to get back into the class? Um, honestly, I'm somewhat puzzled about that because the university has said that they want to do it when they can do it safely. I specifically asked them what that would mean, what safety indicators needed to be in place. Um, I'm not saying that it's the wrong decision to keep the program closed. I don't know that, but I don't know what the university thinks would make it safer. Uh, and before that, I can't really offer suggestions. Like I could say, you know, everybody should be vaccinated, presumably to work on campus, they already should be. If they're going to be in close quarters with attendants, they should probably wear masks. I'm assuming that would have been in any safety plan. So I don't know what the university is waiting for. There was something that you, you talked about in your article where you talked about sort of some students sort of understood that there were risks already going into school already. So this pandemic is just an added sort of risk on top of that. And there were some students who are, you know, sort of okay to go back into into the classroom. Uh, what, did, what did they have to say about it? It seems, you know, they, they want to be in. Yeah, it seems like opinions were divided on that. Like I spoke to some people that really did want to go back and some people that said that they weren't ready. Honestly, I think most people that I spoke to that didn't want to go back go to school at Algonquin College, where most of the classes are still offered online. So I think possibly the impacts to them might be less. But um, the people that I spoke to, and from what I've heard, the people um, that are ad advocating for this at Carleton really do want to go back. Um, they understand the risks. Um, but they say, you know, we have to have support workers and caregivers no matter what. The only question is whether we will be doing it at Carleton or whether we will be doing it at home. And frankly, if people are only at, allotted two hours of care per week at home, that is not safe for them. That is not um, 
reducing their risk in any appreciable way. We're going to have to leave it there, Sarah. Of course, a story that we will continue to follow. Thank you so much for this. Thank you. The agenda this week spoke to Canada's most decorated Olympian, Penny Alexiak, learned how more of us are hiking the Trans-Canada Trail, and debated the role of private care in our public health care system. The agenda's week in review begins in Hamilton, and the debate about growing the city tall or the sprawl. What started this debate in Hamilton to begin with? Well, basically, uh, it's it's a complex uh, situation that has had uh, many twists and turns, but the Ontario government has asked municipalities in the Greater Golden Horseshoe, which, you know, includes Hamilton, places like Peterborough, uh, Niagara Falls, all the way up to Orillia, to uh, plan for growth uh, up to the year 2050. And basically, that means, in Hamilton's case, according to provincial pro projections, the city can expect another uh, 230,000 people, bringing it to around 800,000 people over 30 years. So the city has been engaged in this complex uh, planning exercise to try and fit all that growth uh, within the city boundary. Uh, city planners, however, have said, look, this is a lot to, to, to fit into our city boundary. And we think based on the uh, provincial uh, methodology, which is based on a market-based uh, approach to what people would likely want to have in a type of home, whether it's a single family home, a condominium, or even a townhouse, or you know, row housing. We think that we're going to need an urban boundary expansion into rural lands of about 1,300 uh, hectares. So uh, that that is what is driving the debate and uh, uh, some some anti-sprawl people, as they call themselves, have said, "Look, that's that's not good. We uh, need to preserve this farmland, and in in the context of a climate emergency, we need to try and prevent any sprawl and uh, to to keep carbon emissions down. And of course, this also affects uh, things like infrastructure costs. If you start expanding your city, it's going to cost." Uh, the city more to pay for things like pipes and roads and, uh, you know, fire facilities, for example. However, uh, on the other side of the coin, uh, some of the, the landowners up there, uh, property developers are saying, look, uh, we've been sitting on this these properties uh, in some cases for, for decades and we want to develop them. We believe that Hamilton uh, needs more of these um, ground-oriented homes, as they call them, to uh, increase the supply, which in turn will uh, uh, alleviate what is uh, an affordability crisis. And that, in a nutshell, is what's happening. City Council uh, has to, at some point soon, sign off on uh, what Hamilton's land needs will be, which will uh, determine whether there we have this boundary expansion or if we hold the urban boundary fixed, as uh, some of the anti-sprawl people are, are advocating. Let's put a map up for starters here and just talk about the, we're going to focus on this area. And for those who are listening on podcast and can't see the map, I'll just describe it a little bit. What you are essentially looking at on the top part of this picture that's the mountain. That's what everybody calls the mountain. You can tell, right, some of the north-south street names, Upper Paradise, Upper James, Upper Gage, Upper Ottawa. That's the mountain. And then looking south as well. And remember, in Hamilton, the water is north. So at the top of this map, past downtown, is Lake Ontario. The shaded areas, the shaded areas that are gray, that's where development is currently allowed. The white areas, which is also known as the white belt, that's currently farmland, and that's where the city is considering slash debating whether or not to allow development in those areas. Now, let's get everybody's position on, and obviously there's a lot more gray and there's a little bit of white, and the city's going to determine what's possible under the current circumstances. Let's get everybody's position on the record here. Uh, Lloyd Ferguson, should there be development allowed in those white belt spaces? I'm still uh, listening to that issue. Uh... Clearly, um, there's two sides on this issue, two very strong issues, but we're used to facing those kind of things. We've 
just dealt with the LRT, although we got four years of construction coming now. We're dealing with a Shadow Creek, uh, all this encampment problem we have throughout the city, the Red Hill Valley Judicial Review, and, and now the urban boundary expansion. On, on each issue, there's always fors and against. So I'm going to continue listening. Um, I, I've heard loud and clear from the uh, no side, but I'm starting to hear a lot more from the yes side. John Paul Danko, tell me uh, your view on whether or not development should be allowed in those so-called white belt spaces. No, I think we need to take a firm line and stop the uh, the growth pattern of sprawl development. And this is a, an issue that's facing municipalities across Ontario. And I think there's a, a new renewed interest in um, where we grow and how we grow as a municipality. And I think we need to grow up, not out. Lily Noble, your view on this. Hi. Um, absolutely, we don't need to use the white belt right now. That, that is prime agricultural land that needs to be preserved for the future. Um, back in 2006, um, lots of land, 11,000 acres was brought into the urban boundary. We haven't used it up. Um, so why would we include more? Is this just a land grab by developers who want to, um, you know, make tons of money because land that's zoned agricultural, they buy it cheap, and then uh, once it's zoned urban, they can make 10 times more money off of it. So we think it's just a land grab and it's unnecessary and the sprawl that would uh, occur is just too costly for Hamiltonians. Mike Collins-Williams, your view. I think we need a combination of solutions and a balanced approach. Hamilton needs to grow up, uh, meaning that we do need significant uh, increases in intensification, especially around transit and uh, creating a new skyline in Hamilton. We need to build in which means more missing middle housing within existing neighborhoods. And yes, we do need a small boundary expansion uh, to accommodate a diversity of different housing typologies to meet the full life cycle needs of Hamiltonians. How meaningful is it to you to be the most decorated Canadian Olympian ever? Um, I mean, it's honestly more weird for me than anything else, I feel like. Just um, knowing myself, I look at myself as like the same grade nine kid that I was when I was 14, honestly. Like I see myself that way no matter how old I am. And so for me, it's really weird. And I'll always say to my friends, it's such a weird thing that it's actually me that has seven medals and is the most decorated athlete. But I mean, just to be able to represent Canada and to be able to be the most decorated athlete in Canada, that's it's just insane to me. Now, you broke the record of Cindy Clausen and Clara Hughes, both of whom had six. Have you spoken to either or both of them since you got the seventh medal? Um, I haven't got to speak to either of them directly, unfortunately. However, um, I did get a message from one of the girls uh, when I was doing an interview pretty much just after the Olympics. And um, I think it was Cindy and she was like super sweet and really kind and I'm just like really grateful that I'm even that well known on the world stage like that. Nice. Where are all the medals incidentally, Penny? Um, I mean, ideally my mom would want them in the safe uh, <laughs> at on like RBC branch or something like that. But um, for me, I like to keep them just with me in my sock drawer or something like that. Are you kidding? That's where they are in a sock drawer? Uh, I don't want to give too much away. I don't want anyone to come to my house. But right now, they are, but they're going to go in the safe soon, I swear. That sounds like a good move. Okay, very nice. I watched that YouTube video that you made, uh, which uh, I have to say was quite adorable, and in it you said, your greatest fear in life is open water, which, of course, yeah. makes no sense to me. So can you please explain how the greatest swimmer in Canadian history is somehow afraid of open water? I'm, I'm not afraid of pools sometimes. It depends. Like, if I'm by myself in a pool, it's a little scary. I, I always like to think of how many sharks could fit in the pool with me. But, um, no, I can't do open water. I'm terrified. I'll start, like, crying and, like, hyperventilating as soon as I'm in open water. And I've tried everything, and it just, I can't get over my fear. Do you appreciate that that makes no sense at all? Yeah, no, I definitely, yeah. Yeah, it makes no sense, but I can't do anything about it. <laughs> and have you, you've seen the movie Jaws, I presume? Way too many times, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Well, that makes sense. Okay. We have seen in the past year 
Simone Biles, Carey Price of the Montreal Canadiens, uh, Naomi Osaka, the tennis player. We have seen young and not so young. Carey Price is not so young anymore. Um, high performance athletes deal with mental health challenges, the likes of which I don't think we've ever seen before, or it certainly has never been this public before. And I wonder, given how much you put into this, whether this is something you think about in your own life. Um, yeah, I mean, I struggled a lot growing up with uh, different mental health challenges. I struggled a lot in the last few years with like eating disorders and really trying to figure all of that out. So for me, it's definitely things I have thought about. It's stuff that I've had to learn about. I've had to learn about myself a lot. And um, I've had to teach the people around me how to deal with things I'm dealing with. And it's it's definitely been a long learning experience. But I think now more than ever, athletes are speaking out about it to social channels and they're speaking out about it to media. And I think that's really important because I think it just is going to kind of push not only other athletes to maybe seek help or maybe to look and see if like they could improve as an athlete or as a person like dealing with these mental health issues themselves or if just a regular person is going to actually just go and actually seek help if they see their favorite athlete is also dealing with things and getting help for it. So I think it's really important that athletes are speaking out about the challenges that they've dealt with. I saw a, a recent Leger survey the other day which mm -hmm. showed the trail uses up 40 percent year mm -hmm. over year. What do you attribute mm -hmm. that to? Well, it's, we wanted to go beyond the anecdotal, but our trail uh, groups are telling us that they're seeing more people out than ever. Uh, I'm seeing it. Um, I saw it just this morning. I saw it all weekend as Canadians are outdoors. I think the pandemic and its social isolation has driven people outside where they feel safer, where there's an opportunity to connect. And I think that word connect has had a powerful impetus during the pandemic as people think about how the social order has changed. The pandemic has had profound implications on us all, be they tragic implications, mental health implications, isolated seniors, isolated Canadians of all ages, and being outside and on the trail uh, really has been the healing factor for them. And that's what's showing up in our data too. So not only are they using trails more, but 95% of Canadians in that same survey said that mental health and enhancing their mental health, an equal measure to those saying their physical health, by the way, is really what got them out their front door with their shoes on. And that's the other nice part of the trail, about Trail Sorry and the Trans-Canada Trail in particular, is that you don't need a lot of equipment. You know, in Canada, we say there's no bad weather, only bad clothing. <laughs> and so if you have a warm coat in the wintertime and a hat and a pair of gloves and and some decent walking shoes, you can go pretty much anywhere. And that's the beauty of the trail too, because there's, uh, there's an equal measure of that that speaks to the equity and the importance of getting outside. And as Canadians were driven indoors, unfortunately, and more and more isolated, many of us found ourselves, especially if we live in a densely populated urban environment, in, in our box, sometimes in the sky with no backyard, and so the desire to get outside because we were living and working in the same environment became that much more pronounced. So getting outside, connecting to nature, we know that it has positive mental health benefits. We did a campaign with CAMH last year at the onset of winter because we knew what was coming. And we knew that Canadians would profoundly feel the encroaching and oncoming uh, darkness and isolation. And we were concerned about their mental health. And it turns out a lot of people were as well. So our applause to Oz campaign hmm. featured leading Canadians across the country, mayors, Olympic athletes, doing a social media campaign with Cam H and us to talk about those mental health benefits. And I'm seeing that more every day myself as I get out on the trail. And uh, anecdotally, I'm seeing more people. It's allowed me to meet people in my neighborhood that I otherwise would not have met. And I think Canadians are rediscovering their communities their connections, there's that word again, to each other and to the world around them and to nature, which is also pervasive. Canadians love the great outdoors and they love to find opportunities to connect to that nature in their backyard, down the street, around the corner, across town, 
on their bicycle or with their walking shoes. And that's what the trail does. Yeah, I don't think there's any easy solution, but I, I wouldn't go for a dominant ideology if it's uh, not working. And I'm, I'm not defending the private sector at all here, but I just think that a predominantly uh, public sector will is kind of ruthless in the sense that it says if you don't need, you can't have immediately or you have blocks on, on your access. So I think some alleviation of the public sector may be appropriate, uh, but ultimately that's a political decision to re which would reflect the preferences of the Canadian population. And I'm certainly not going to tell any Canadians what to do. <laughs> All right. Sarah, maybe I can get you to come in here on the Shwili case because, you know, the, the, what emerged from that case was the very strong signal sent by the court that if the Canadian Medicare system can't get people timely treatment to help their ailments, uh, then, then it is legitimate for them to look to a, a, a different system to try to get timely treatment. What has been the impact of that decision over the years? Well, it's a great question. At the time, there was this kind of shock, like, is this going to increase the, you know, uh, options in the pi private sector? Are we going to have a sort of escalation in, in growth in the private health insurance market? And what we saw is that there wasn't much of a change. And on the sort of positive side, the government was really motivated to make some of these improvements that we're talking about. And I fully agree that we're you know, we have constraints, we ration care based on wait lists, and that these wait lists are too long. But the government in, in Quebec decided to, you know, use this, uh, you know, this court case to actually make improvements to and set these benchmarks for uh, what is a reasonable wait time for the priority procedures in the province. And in the combination of, you know, ensuring these targets that were met, um, as well as the fact that physicians really didn't have the opportunity to work in both sectors. There's still other rules constraining um, physician behavior in Quebec, like in other provinces that Alistair mentioned earlier around, you know, you can't work in both the public system and the private system simultaneously. Those rules remained in place. And so we didn't see a huge escalation in private health insurance or in private um, parallel practice in that province. And so it's a, it's really interesting that it shows us that maybe we can address the problem of wait times with the you know currently publicly funded system, and uh, you know prevent the kind of escalation of private insurance that many other governments across the world are trying to contain, and look to Canada to see what are the rules that we have in place that help us to maintain and protect the public system without allowing a growth of private health health insurance. That does tend to undermine equity goals. If if we do have equity goals, then these might be worth uh, maintaining. Um, so it's a really interesting question. And um, in fact, in, in the Swedish government recently invited us to come and talk to to them to say, how do we prevent the private health insurance from growing beyond they're at about two percent of the population? They're worried that it's growing too high. How does Canada maintain this uh, distinction? And wanted to learn about the context here because it was lauded as a, an exemplar. I've still it's got a really lot to, interesting to learn. Forgive me. I still got a lot to get to here. But Colleen, I want a quick response from you, if I can, on the impact of the Shwili case and whether it had the both feared and or other consequences that many wondered about. It didn't result in the uh, unbundling of or significant growth of a two tier health care system in Quebec uh, because of an adroit response by the premier at the time to introduce wait time guarantees, as Sarah just said. But I think normatively it's had a big impact because, um, you know, a bare majority of the Supreme Court indicated that, you know, perhaps two-tier healthcare is some kind of an option. Um, the devil's a lot in the detail. Uh, the, it was really a, sm a small challenge to the law that prohibits the purchase of private health insurance. Uh, following on its heels, the much bigger challenge has been go uh, underway in, um, in the Canby case that uh, Alistair is a, a witness in. And there they're challenging all the rules. So the rules that stop doctors working in both public and private. Um, it's a little unclear, but at first they were also challenging the rules that stop doctors billing above the amount that they are paid by the public system, the extra billing, uh, and the um, private health insurance rules. So 
Yeah, they're really going for the big kahuna, if you like, trying to knock over everything. And what the effect of that would be, um, would be possibly chaos. And it would depend on the political stripe, probably, of the government in charge when, you know, we, were that case to be successful. What would they do? Would they do as Quebec did and try to protect the public health care system? Or would they say, yee let's let a rip and, um, you know, we, we don't really like equality and equity and access anyway. We'd prefer the rich to have more. So it's a chaos kind of a strategy. Um, I think I see Alistair trying to jump in on that. Alistair, did you want a word? Well, well, well I don't think it's a all or nothing, right? It, you can have mediated extremes and you can, I, I th I'm not saying it's not complex, but you're not going to have, you're, you're absolutely right to pitch it as equity versus some form of enhanced choice and uh, access. And it is true that the private health insurance would probably uh, be taken up by the wealthier rather than the poorer in society for obvious reasons. But it could be progressive. That's just some of what we covered this week on the agenda. For more, including the full conversations, you can visit our website, tvo.org, our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash the agenda, or our Twitter feed, twitter.com slash the agenda. And that's it for this Friday, October 15th, 2021. Monday, we'll look at vaccine passports in the workplace and whether they could be adding trouble to an already tight labor market in Ontario. I'm Nam Kiwanuka. Thank you for watching TVO and for joining us online at tvo.org. Have a great weekend and we'll see you again on Monday. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Ontario hubs are made possible by the Barry and Lori Green Family Charitable Trust and Goldie Feldman.